Number 1. Melinda was last seen on March 24, 2003, at a residence on Kent Road in Atmer, Alabama. She had arrived home from work where she was a nurse on the night shift at a Bay Minette, Alabama nursing home at 8 a.m. that day. Her husband, Troy McGee, was at that time at work at Mosland Carpets. Their two children were with a babysitter, and Troy's son from a previous relationship was at the dentist's. Melinda spoke to Troy and to her mother on the phone at approximately 8.30 a.m. She has never been heard from again. Troy came home at close to 4 p.m. that afternoon and found his wife missing. There was blood and other evidence of a violent struggle in their house. He reported her missing at that time. Melinda's vehicle was found parked near the house with her keys locked inside. Her purse and cellular phone were inside the residence. There was evidence of a struggle inside her home, but no indications that anyone had been murdered there. Foul play is suspected in her disappearance, authorities believe McGee was assaulted and abducted while she was sleeping. She and her husband had been happily married for seven years and had been planning a weekend trip to the beach when Melinda vanished. Their home is at the end of a dead-end dirt road in a rural area, near Porch, Alabama. There are only three other houses on the road. Authorities are looking into the possibility that Derek Todd Lee, the alleged Baton Rouge serial killer, was involved in Melinda's apparent abduction. Lee has been charged with the murders of six southern Louisiana women and is suspected in numerous other murders, rapes, and disappearances in the Baton Rouge, Louisiana area. He has been charged with murdering Randy Mebrewer and is considered a possible suspect in the disappearance of Mary Fowler and Glenn Tankersley. A photo of Lee is posted with this case summary. Melinda's case is similar to Mebrewer's, but as Melinda disappeared 250 miles away from Baton Rouge, Lee is not considered a strong suspect. Suspected serial killer Jeremy Brian Jones is also a suspect in her disappearance, a photograph of Jones is posted with this case summary. He is also a suspect in the murder of Patrice Endress, who missing for 18 months before her remains were found in December 2005. Melinda's case remains unsolved, she is presumed to be a victim of foul play. Number 2. Islam was last seen in Fort Worth, Texas on January 16, 2006. She has never been heard from again. The last person known to have seen her was Christopher Revel, her boyfriend and the father of her three-month-old son. A photo of Revel is posted with this case summary. After her disappearance, he dropped off their child with one of Islam's relatives. He claimed the last time he saw Islam, they had an argument and she got into the car with someone he didn't know and left. In October 2016, Revel was arrested and charged with kidnapping Tiffany Johnson, who was last seen in his company in Ulis, Texas on October 10, 2016. She was his ex-girlfriend and they were last seen arguing with each other. Revel's explanation for her disappearance was the same for Islam's. She got into a vehicle with someone he didn't know and rode away. He was indicted for aggravated kidnapping with intent to terrorize, the charge was later upgraded to kidnapping with intent to kill. In August 2019, after two days' jury deliberations, Revel was convicted of Johnson's kidnapping. He was sentenced to life in prison. Islam's family stated Revel was abusive towards her and they believe he was involved in her disappearance, but police haven't identified him as a suspect and said there's no hard evidence to link him to her case. Her disappearance remains unsolved. Number 3 Tiffany was a junior at the University of Florida in Gainesville in 1989, she majored in finance. She resided in the 2600 block of Southwest 35th Place in Casablanca East Condominiums. Tiffany told her roommate she was going to take a walk along Williston Road at approximately 6 p.m. on February 9, 1989. Witnesses saw a woman matching Tiffany's description speaking to several unidentified individuals in a vehicle shortly afterwards. The woman may have entered the car, but the witnesses were uncertain. Authorities have never confirmed if the person was Tiffany. She has never been heard from again. She left her wallet, keys and identification inside her residence. Michael Christopher Nickbacher was considered a possible suspect in Tiffany's case for many years. He was sentenced to five terms of life in prison in 1990 for the 1989 rape of a 20-year-old Gainesville college student. He had a prior record for sex offenses and other crimes in 2005. He pleaded no contest to first-degree murder in the 1989 shooting death of a 12-year-old Stark, Florida girl. He was given an additional life sentence for the crime and will be 74 years old by the time he becomes eligible for parole. A photo of Knickerbocker is posted with this case summary. He allegedly told other inmates that he chained Tiffany to a tree near Gainesville on the night of her disappearance. 
Nick Bakker claimed that he murdered her shortly afterwards and disposed of her remains in the Caloosahatchee River near Fort Myers, Florida. Investigators searched the area after receiving the information from an informant, but no evidence was found at the scene. Authorities stated that materials connected to Tiffany's disappearance may have been lost in the surf as a result of the time lapse. But it may be worth noting that Knickerbocker lived near the victim he killed and near the scene of his prior rape, but he wasn't living in Gainesville when Tiffany disappeared. Knickbocker also mentioned that Tiffany's sweatshirt was buried outside of Gainesville. Investigators searched the specified location in August 2002 and recovered a piece of blood-soaked material. Authorities tested the material to determine if Tiffany's DNA was on the item. The results have not been publicly announced. Several media outlets reported that the material did not appear to originate from a sweatshirt. In February 2014, nearly 25 years after Tiffany's disappearance, a suspect was named in her kidnapping and presumed murder. Paul Rowles. A photo of Rowles is posted with this case summary. He had been sentenced to life in prison for a 1976 murder in Miami-Dade County, Florida, but was released from prison in 1985. In 1994, he was sentenced on multiple 19 counts including sexual battery, attempted sexual battery, kidnapping and loot and lascivious molestation. His victim in that case, a 19-year-old Clearwater, Florida woman, managed to escape. He died of natural causes in 2013 at the age of 64, still in prison. Investigators believe Rowles was a serial killer and Tiffany was his second victim. They're searching for her body near the site where his other known murder victim was buried. Shortly after his death, DNA linked him to the unsolved murder of a 21-year-old woman whose body was found in a shallow grave only about a mile from where Tiffany disappeared. He is known to have delivered scaffolding to a construction project along Tiffany's jogging path. Authorities also found a day planner Rowles kept in prison, which, while it did not mention Tiffany's name, did have the number 2 written next to the date of her disappearance. The Rolex company has flagged Tiffany's watch, so they will be notified if anyone tries to sell or pawn it. The watch can be identified by its unique serial number. Tiffany's case remains unsolved. There have not been any arrests in connection to her disappearance. Number 4. Carlene was last seen in Macon, Georgia on June 21, 1972. That afternoon, she left her home on East Street and drove her family's white 1963 Pontiac station wagon to the now-defunct Westgate Shopping Center off Pio Nono Avenue. She had a driver's license for only a short time, and this was the first time she'd driven anywhere alone. Carlene planned to pick up her younger sister from summer day camp after she left the shopping center. She invited her younger brother and older sister to accompany her, but neither of them wanted to go, and so Carlene left alone. She saw some boys she knew at the shopping center and stopped at her boyfriend's workplace behind the shopping center and left a note on his car telling him she'd see him that night. Carlene never returned home and has never been heard from again. Her mother realized she was missing when Carlene's younger sister called to say she hadn't been picked up from camp. Carlene's mother notified the police, but they refused to begin a search until 24 hours had passed. The Pontiac was found at the shopping center at 1.45 a.m. the next day, parked in front of a Krispy Kreme donut shop. The windows were rolled down and the doors were unlocked, and Carlene's loved ones don't believe she would have left the vehicle in this condition. There was no sign of her at the scene. Carlene's sister believes the car was parked at that location only a short time before it was found. Carlene's father was in Florida on business at the time of her disappearance, he traveled frequently as part of his job. Almost a year after Carlene disappeared, her family moved to North Carolina. They left a phone behind at their Macon home, hooked up to a search hotline number, and asked the new owners to answer it in case Carlene called. She never did, although the new owners kept the phone in service for two years. In 1977, Carlene's parents returned to Macon and settled into a residence about four miles from their old one. Her younger sister also returned to Macon as an adult. Carlene's father is deceased and her mother died in 2016, but her sister is sister still alive and in the Macon area. Carlene was a rising junior at Southwest High School in 1972, and her hobbies included drawing, dancing and playing the clarinet and violin. Her case remains unsolved. Number 5. Daniels was last seen in the parking lot at Pensacola State College in Pensacola, Florida at 5 p.m. on August 12, 2013. She worked there as a theater technician. She left her job early that day to go home and has never been heard from again. Her vehicle, a great Toyota 4Runner with the Florida license plate number ECBR, was found abandoned on August 20. 
it was parked in the parking lot of Park West at Pensacola Beach. Daniel's cellular phone, purse, bicycle and other belongings were inside it, along with a jug of water, peanut butter and some clothes. An extensive search of the area turned up no indication of her whereabouts. The car had two fingerprints on the door that did not match Daniel's or any of her family or friends, police ran the prints through a database but were unable to identify them. Photos of the car and its license plate are posted with this case summary. Little evidence is available in Daniel's disappearance. Before she went missing, she had told her work supervisor she would be gone for several days, but didn't say why, and she didn't tell anyone else either. Her family stated it would be uncharacteristic of Daniels to make plans like that without telling anyone. After her disappearance, there were several reported sightings of her along Interstate 10. One theory is that she became a victim of human trafficking. Police continue to search for Tiffany, and while the Daniels also continue to search for their daughter, they have also found themselves consumed with wanting to help others. When asked what's next, we do continue to work as advocates for families, said Rodney. When a search is going on, we stay with the family while the teams are out searching. With a lifelong career in fire and emergency services, Rodney now speaks to law enforcement nationwide, educating them on the signs of human trafficking. As so many families of missing loved ones find themselves, they become experts in the field of missing persons. The Daniels have found that working with other families of missing children and adults gives them the strength to continue searching for their own child. To not only bring her home but to ward off the feeling of desperation and accompanying depression that can be all-consuming. Tiffany's parents face the ambiguity with courage and determination and have dedicated their lives to bring their Tiffany home, no matter what the ending. Every family with a missing person's case needs closure because you fall into that gray area and you don't know which is worse, said Cindy. It is Cindy and Rodney's hope that keeps them going while daily they wait for some word. Until someone brings me a body or a piece of her body, I'm never going to give up that she's alive and that she will come and show up at our door, said Rodney. Daniels is described as an artistic young woman who also enjoys hiking. She was born in Dallas, Texas. Her case remains unsolved. Number 6. Carlene was last seen in Rollins, Wyoming on July 4, 1974. She and a 19-year-old friend, Christine Ann Christie Gross, visited the Little Bridges Rodeo at the fairgrounds that day. Both of them disappeared afterwards, and their vehicle was found abandoned. Accounts differ as to where it was either at the fairgrounds or in the town of Warland, Wyoming, over 200 miles to the north. Authorities initially believed they'd left on their own, but began to investigate other possibilities as time passed, and no one heard from either of the women. A photo of Christie is posted with this case summary. Two other females besides Carlene and Christie disappeared in July and August 1974 in the Rollins area. Deborah Meyer disappeared on August 4 while walking to a movie theater, and 10-year-old Jaylene Dawn Banker disappeared on August 23 from the Rollins fairgrounds. Jaylene's partially clothed body was found in a field on April 24, 1975, eight months after her disappearance, like Christie, she had been murdered, killed with a blow to the head. Christie's body was found three miles south of Sinclair, Wyoming in October 1983, nine years after her disappearance, she had been killed by two heavy blows to the skull. There was no sign of Carlene at the scene, and she has never been heard from again. Deborah has also never been found. Jaylene and Christie's homicides are unsolved. Royal Russell Long is considered a possible suspect in Deborah and Carlene's disappearances and Christie and Jaylene's murders. He pleaded guilty to kidnapping Sharon Baldigal and was also charged with the murders of Cinda Pallet and Charlotte Kinsey, but the latter charges were dismissed for lack of evidence. Long lived in the Rollins area in 1974 and worked at local fairs and carnivals. He died in prison in 1993 and was never convicted in connection with any missing people besides Sharon. A photo of him is posted with this case summary. Carlene was adopted, and investigators don't know the identity or whereabouts of her birth family. Her adoptive parents divorced prior to 1974. She lived in Rollins with her father and brother at the time of her disappearance, her mother lived in Colorado. She had graduated from Rollins High School in 1973, she had been active in many extracurricular activities, including sports, during her school years. All of Carlene's adoptive family are now deceased. Her case remains unsolved. Foul play is suspected. Number 7. Sharon ran away from her hometown of Eagle Butte, South Dakota on September 18, 1984, along with a 15-year-old friend named Sandy. 
The girls were hitchhiking together in Casper, Wyoming, when they were picked up by a truck driver named Royal Russell Long. A photo of him is posted with this case summary. Long took the two girls to his home in Evansville, Wyoming, and fed them. Sandy stated he then offered them $100 for sexual services. When the girls refused, he tied them up at gunpoint, beat Sharon and raped Sandy. Sandy escaped and went for help, but by the time police arrived at the residence, Long and Sharon were gone. A week later, Long was apprehended Albuquerque, New Mexico. Sharon wasn't with him, and he said he did not know her whereabouts. When asked for his side of the story, Long said Sharon and Sandy had told them they were 18 and 19, and that Sandy agreed to have sex with him for $100. After the sex act took place, Sandy demanded $200 from him and threatened to accuse him of rape if he did not comply, and she and Sharon told him they were actually only 15 and 12 years old. Long said there was a struggle, although he did not hit the girls, and his nose was bloodied. He threatened them with a pistol and tied them up. He then took a nap, and when he woke up he discovered Sandy had escaped. He carried Sharon out to his truck and drove her to Cheyenne, then put her on a light-colored truck bound for Dallas, Texas, and this was the last time he ever saw her. He said he didn't realize he was wanted for kidnapping and rape until he went back to Casper. According to Long, after realizing the police were looking for him, he drove to Amarillo, Texas, trying to find Sharon or anyone who might have seen her. Authorities were unable to find anything to support his story, they couldn't identify the truck driver Sharon supposedly got a ride to Dallas with or find anyone who had seen this trucker or his truck. Prosecutors considered charging Long with Sharon's murder, but they decided against it, and Sharon's father stated he believed his daughter was alive. Long pleaded guilty to two counts of kidnapping for the purpose of committing indecent liberties with a minor and was sentenced to two life terms in prison. Long is also a possible suspect in the disappearances of Deborah Meyer and Carlene Brown, who vanished from Wyoming in 1974, and he is the prime suspect in the disappearances of Cinda Pallett and Charlotte Kinsey, who vanished from the Oklahoma State Fairgrounds in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma on September 26, 1981. He was charged with kidnapping and murdering Cinda and Charlotte after his 1985 arrest, but the charges were dismissed for lack of evidence. He died of a heart attack in prison in 1993. Sharon's father went to visit him shortly before his death, but Long refused to speak to him. Sharon is the oldest of four siblings and had just begun her first year Brainerd Indian School in Hot Springs, South Dakota when she disappeared. Her father is still alive and searched for her all over the country after her disappearance, traveling as far as Arizona. There were possible sightings of her in Wisconsin and Colorado in the years following her disappearance. She has never been found and foul play is suspected in her case.